Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Seemed like I had lost the button that took and made the change around uh, from the camera that came toward me to the one that went towards you. I'm sorry about that. Like I said, we're going to be looking at the attributes of the Antichrist today. Last week, we covered the four views on Revelation. And today, we will look at some of the attributes of the Antichrist. Now, if you notice, the word anti is spelled A-N-T-E. Because real definition of Antichrist can have a dual uh, definition. It can mean A-N-T-I, which is against Christ. Or it can take and it can be A-N-T-E, which means take the place of Christ. And that's exactly what we find that the Antichrist did. The Antichrist took the place of Christ, as we're going to find out in, you know, the attributes of the Antichrist. Now, number one, we find that the Antichrist will receive its power and authority from the beast. And in my teaching last week, I brought out to you that when you see the word beast in the Bible, you take and you go back to the Old Testament and you find out what the beast represented. And the beast represents the ruling power. We find that there was a beast that represented uh, Babylon. There was a one that uh, represented Greece. And there was one that represented the Roman Empire. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So the beast is symbolical to the ruling power. And then we find that the dragon is Satan. As you go through all of these different scriptures, you need to realize that the dragon that we're going to see is Satan himself. Revelation 12 and verse 9 says, the great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. Now, we find that the Antichrist is going to be political and religious. Revelation chapter 17 and verse number 3 says, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, in prophecy, a woman is defined as, you know, a church. Number two, the Antichrist will sit on seven mountains. Revelation chapter 17, 3b the seven heads represent seven mountains, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now here we find the seven hills of Rome that surround the Vatican. I know that many of you took and probably read recently where the, the Pope, you know, kind of condemned Trump for wanting to build a wall you know, that separated the United States. Yet we find that he has a wall around the Vatican. But beside that, we find that there are seven hills of Rome. And we need to remember that. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman or the church sitteth. Revelation chapter 17 and verse number 9. Number four, after the 1260 years, 1260 years, the beast will be mortally wounded. Revelation 13 and three says, and I saw one of his heads as if it was wounded to death. Now what happened at the end of 1260 years? What occurred at that time? We find that, you know, Gutenberg invented, you know, the printing press. And he began to print Bibles. And people began to take and they were able to get a Bible to be able to read for themselves. And we find that all of a sudden, men begin to take and to see, we have been deceived for 1,260 years. You know, and we have taken, we have gone through the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, and now, today, we're able to read the scripture for ourselves. We're able to see the light. 
And the Bible is the Word of God. So number five, the Antichrist also is to be a blasphemous power. What is a blasphemous power? Revelation chapter 13 and verse one says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns upon his horns, 10 crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Now let's look at the Bible. Does the Bible take and kind of give us a reasoning or a definition of what blasphemy is talking about? Well, in St. John chapter 10, verse 33, it says, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thou self God. You know what the Roman Catholic Church said in the Catholic National of July 1895? They said the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. So we find, you see, that they have been committing blasphemy all <coughs> these years. Now let's look a little further. The Antichrist will force the world to worship him. Revelation 13 and 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. During that 1,260 years, you need to understand that the Antichrist power the Roman Catholic Church forced people to take and to worship the Pope and to worship the church. And we find that all the kings of the earth took and backed up his power. Every king of this earth of that day took and they backed him up and they forced people to take and to bow down before him. And we find that even the kings themselves would bow down and they would kiss the earth that he walked on. And so all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Number seven, the Antichrist is controlled by a man whose name will add up to 666. Revelation 13, 17 and 18 says, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast are the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is a number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now six six is God's number for man, then six 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 must be a succession of men. Not only that, we find it written on that you know, that uh, crown that is upon the Pope is the Latin Vicarius Felidea. And Vicarius means taking the place of or substituting for. Feli means the Son, and Dea means God. Hallelujah. Substituting for the Son of God. And then when you take the Roman numerals for Vicarius, and add them up, they come to 112. And we find that the numbers in Latin for Philly come to 53. And the numbers for Dia in Latin come to 501. You add them together and you have 666 there. Exactly as the Bible took and spoke about. And then number eight, the Antichrist will make war with the saints. Daniel chapter seven, verse 25 and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. I don't know if you re, you know, realize it or not, but we find that the Albigenses were apostolic people during that time. And they would go into the villages of the Albigenses and the Valdenses, and they would force them to become Roman Catholics, or they would kill them and destroy them. We find that it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Number nine, the Antichrist will have no desire for women. 
Have you took and read the articles lately where they took and they were molesting boys? It seems like a lot of them have a desire for boys more than they do women. But we find that Daniel chapter 11 verse 37 says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. The Vatican boldly declared in their catechism, celebrity is the renunciation of marriage implicitly or explicitly made for the most perfect observance of chastity by all those who receive the sacrament of orders in any of the higher grades. Absolutely every person on earth knows that the Roman Catholic priests, bishops, cardinals, and popes are not married. Number 10, the Antichrist assumes authority to change God's law. Daniel 7.25 says, He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, I want you to take and study that just a minute. This is what the Catholic Mirror said. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant church, but it's meaning, by virtue of, her, virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. What did they change? Why do we worship on Sunday today? We worship on Sunday because the Roman Catholic Church changed the day of worship to the worship of of the Roman God, the sun God, from Saturday, which is the Sabbath day, to Sunday, which was the day that they took and they worshiped the sun God. Not only that, in 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th ordered a new calendar, the Gregorian calendar, and that's the one that you use today. And he took and he took and he rewrote the Julian calendar. And today we go by the Gregorian calendar that was named after Pope Gregory. Not only that, he changed New Year's Day from April the 1st. Boy, I tell you what, now we know why they call it April's Fool's Day, don't we? <laughs> Praise God. He changed New Year's Day from April the 1st to January the 1st. And we find that the Roman Gregorian calendation, we find that the crest of Pope Gregory revealed a dragon on it. Think about that. It says, And the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with a remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty, the mark of, of the beast. You're waiting today, well, it used to be what? A social security guard that was going to be the mark of the beast. Then it was something else that was going to be the mark of the beast. Today, they're going to take and insert a little something under your skin, and that's going to be the mark of the beast. But I want you to think about this. Revelation 13, 16 says, and he causeth all, both great and small, the small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man buy, buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, I want to explain something to you. When the Roman Catholic armies, armies went into those Abagenzi apostolic villages and they took and they killed the fighting men of that village. They then forced everyone else in the village to take and to accept the mark of the beast. Now, what was the beast? That's the ruling power. Who's the ruling power here? We find it's the Roman Catholic Church. And he would not allow them to buy or sell save he that had the mark. They had to take the mark. 
but what did they have to do in order to take the mark? They had to renounce their apostolic faith. Oh, my friend today, there's so many people that are renouncing their apostolic faith. Some take and they sell out over what they're going to wear. Others sell out over what they're going to take and say. Many people take and sell out for many different reasons. But I'm here today to tell you that you need to stay. Praise God. I love our apostolic church today. And like I've said before, I love, praise God, the faith, and I love the foundation principles of the, you know, the United Pentecostal Church. I love those foundation principles today. You see, man got a hold of those foundation principles and men make changes. And we cannot follow men, but we need to follow Jesus Christ. And their apostolic principle is to take and to follow the teachings of the apostle Peter. He was given the keys to the kingdom of God. And so the beast is the Roman Catholic Church of that day and that hour and that time. What did you have to do to become a Roman Catholic? Today, if you're watching a football game and you see a player fall down on his knees after making a touchdown and he makes the sign of the cross, what do you know for a fact? When you're walking down the street with a Catholic friend, and you pass the Roman Catholic Church, and all of a sudden, he makes the sign of the cross. What do you take and think if you didn't know that he was a Roman Catholic friend? We find that the mark of the beast is a symbol that takes and brings you in to the church. The beast, the worship of the beast. And if there is another mark of the beast today, we find that you're not going to go to hell because you take a little chip and put it in your arm, but you'll be lost if you have to take and renounce your apostolic faith. And I believe that is sensible today. If you have to renounce your apostolic faith to take and to have that chip in your arm, you better not do it. You see, there are dual fulfillments in the Bible. And there can be a dual fulfillment. But what God has revealed to me is we're not getting ready for the man of sin. We're getting ready for the rapture of the church where the sons of God rise up to meet him in the air and we take and become a part of that angelic host that comes back to this earth to take and to destroy the nations that come against Israel. That is coming faster than what you realize today. And so we find that the, you know, the mark of the beast, we find was the sign of the cross. It was done with the forehead, it was taken in the head, and we find that, you know, they had to renounce their apostolic faith. Here is the true salvation plan for any of you that are watching today and you really want to know the truth. Because the Bible says you shall know the truth and it is the truth that shall set you free. I took and I, you know, I brought this up quite some time ago. And every one of the books that I have taken and published has the true salvation plan in it. Salvation could be divided into two categories. The first would be man's way. Would you accept in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior without allowing the plan that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about in your life. This first category takes the change that even though Jesus Christ did not give me the new birth, he has still saved me. This plan takes you to the judgment of God to find out if your plan was enough. The second category is God's way. And that's why I'm so thankful to be able to tell you God's way is found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when the apostle Peter was asked by those Jewish people, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission, that means the washing away of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, is to your children, is to all of those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Matthew chapter 24, verse 19, was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. The name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Son is Jesus. The name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. We find that Jesus, the Son of God, is the embodiment of the Father, praise God, and the Holy Spirit. And in him, not them, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Romans 8, 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Would you like to become a son of God? Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want you to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. I want to pray with you today and I want to believe God that he's going to take and he's going to touch your life today. Thank you so much for all of you that have been taken and following me I'm going to be talking about the seven churches of Asia next week. But right now, I want to take and I want to pray with you. If you'd like to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, well, don't you just close your eyes right now. And won't you say, God, I need your faith. I need for you to touch my unbelief. I need for you to touch my doubt. Lord Jesus, help my unbelief right now. Oh, Lord, right now, move out there. Touch someone today. Touch someone with your spirit, Lord. Move upon them, God, today. Move and fall, Kurt, today, Lord Jesus. If there's someone that's, you know, watching this from fall, Kurt, today, I'm asking God to take care of their needs, Lord. Touch them with your spirit. Lord, if there's any demonic spirits that need to be cast out, I take and I bind that spirit in Jesus' name. Devil, there's no distance that can take and separate you from the power of the name of Jesus. I bind every spirit that is in anybody that would love to take and to come back to you, the Lord. In Jesus' name, I bind you today. I command by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ that you loose that child of God right now. In Jesus' name, I command it. Come out of them. In the name of Jesus right now, devil, I bind you and I cast you out in Jesus' name. That child of God that is wanting to be filled with your spirit, devil, you have been hindering their faith long enough. I command you to loose them in Jesus' name. Right now, let your faith, let it grow. Let it expand. Right now, just take and begin to praise the Lord. Begin to take and speak to him and talk to him. Hallelujah. Just keep worshiping him until God fills you with his spirit. It can happen right now. Hallelujah. This can be your day of Pentecost. This can be your Pentecostal experience right now. 
I'm praying right now. Right now, receive the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Just keep on praying. I've got to take it in this service, this live broadcast. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being with me today. Join me again at 3.30 next Sunday in Jesus' name.